Okay, I think I'll start then. Now that we've had a few minutes for people to come in, both in person and online. Um, my name is Daniel Joseph MacArthur Seal. I'm the Assistant Director of the British Institute at Ankara. Um, and I'm very pleased that we are going to have our second hybrid in person slash Zoom lecture today, um, which will be delivered by Gizem Palavja with the title, The Transitional Transnational Life and Agency of Arusiag Iskian, Retracing the Steps of an Obscure Armenian Woman from Merzifon to New York. Gizem Palavja is a historian of the Ottoman Empire, predominantly specializing in Armenian experiences and agency in the late modern period. She has an MA in Middle Eastern Studies from the University of Chicago and a Master of Studies in Syriac Studies from the University of Oxford. Her doctoral thesis, completed at the University of Oxford in 2021, aimed to explore the activities, experiences, aspirations, and social impact of particular members of the Manas family by taking an interactive history approach. She's currently in her second year as a BIA postdoctoral fellow, and her research horizon extends beyond the study of Armenians to the Syriac Christians. Uh, whose histories form the predominant focus of her research agenda for this year. So if I could invite um, Gizem Palavdja to the stage, and just to note that anyone who has online who has any questions um, can use the Q&A box to address those to the speaker, and we'll get to them afterwards. You're also welcome to use the chat feature within Zoom to introduce yourself to others in the virtual audience. Thanks. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending today's lecture, and uh, thank you as well to those who are joining us online. So I have decided to devote this lecture to the story of Arusiak Turk and Iskian, and I will give particular focus to some elements of her life and agency, while only briefly mentioning others, as time constraints will not allow me to address each facet of her life with the same level of attention. So let me succinctly tell you about the individual that this lecture will revolve around. Arusiak Iskian ne Turkian. She was a Marzvansi from Marzofon, uh, Marzofon in the Sivas Vilayet, Armenian woman, who in her youth attended one of the most renowned establishments of the Women's Board of Missions of the Interior, the Anatolia Girls' School. After marrying Yarvant Iskian in 1897, she moved to Ankara with her husband, where he had his roots, and where she remained for over a decade. This part of her life is quite opaque, as I'll further elaborate on below. She moved uh, back to Marsavan in 1912 and was there at the onset of the genocide. Surviving it, she ended up in Allied-occupied Istanbul with her husband and children, and then made her way to the US together with her family in 1922, eventually getting naturalized as an American citizen in 1930 and living in New York until her death in 1945. This is a relatively new project that I had initially devised for and presented at the annual Christmas conference of 2022, themed exploring and contesting the reproduction of coloniality in the Middle East, borders, transnationalism and resistance, and I have kept working and building on it since. This analysis structured around the anchor of Arusiak, a woman from Marsavan in Armenia Minor, problematizes the ubiquitous absence of women from histories and historiography traditions which despite the growing body of incisive and rigorous academic work is still in need of further scholarly attention, as well as robustly challenging notions of undifferentiated passivity and victimhood ascribed to Armenians in the Ottoman context more generally, depriving them of their agency and impact and of the still prevalent autonomous and insular histories rather than interactive ones, as Aslanian highlights. As Elizabeth Rodini puts it, history is made, not found, and it is helpful to use language that acknowledges that act of construction, end quote. Historians have a significant part to play in deciding what is to emerge from the hidden troves of multifarious archival landscapes and in exposing different threads of history that would not otherwise see the light of day by their very actions of choosing a particular event or individual as their subject of study. This act of curation determines whether a topic gets explored or remains unengaged with. Before I start, I'd like to point out that since this is a project in the making, I'd very much appreciate any feedback and comments you may have. So let's get into it, shall we? 
Uh, I would like to take a moment to tell you about how I intend to structure this lecture. I first want to start off by expanding upon my research topic, conceptual lens, theoretical framework, methodology and sources, while also reflecting on some of the limitations and shortcomings posed by the source material. And I'll move on to a brief discussion of how I intend to contribute to the historiographic enterprise with this research before getting into the gist of my talk today. I, I will be using the conceptual lens of movement, most markedly in the form of displacement, first internal, then external and exilic, in assessing our sex life and peripatetic existence in the suggested uh, framework, in and out of cities from Marcelon to Ankara, and then back to Marcelon, later to Constantinople, and finally to New York. What follows will be a microhistorical analysis of Arsiak in the global context of 19th century mobility, transnationalism and coloniality in an attempt to restore her voice and rewrite her into history. The examination of Arsiak as a muted social actor is one where multiple lines of inquiry intersect, enabling a powerful discussion around her intersectionality, cutting across different axes, landscapes and spaces and offering a framework to actively deconstruct the multiple layers of her subalternity and neglect by the historical enterprise, quote, exposing unique modes of discrimination and power relations, end quote. In outlining her life and weaving the gossamer threads of evidence together to reconstruct her social and mental universe, I explore Arsiak and her journey saturated with movement in four spatial temporal configurations by treating them as nexuses where embodied agency occurs. I intend to keep the structure while enriching it further with some new data I have unearthed since presenting the paper in July. For the purposes of this lecture, I'll predominantly be focusing on the context of Marcelin, though I'll also be talking about some moments of Arsiak's agency in Constantinople, and will be sharing brief reconstructions of her life in Ankara and New York. I'll share relevant sections of Arsiak's detailed biography before getting into a more nuanced analysis of her life in each of these contexts. Given that no scholarly accounts, uh, account exists on Arsiak or any members of her immediate family, this will act as an essential backdrop when retracing her steps and engaging with her experiences on a deeper level. Throughout the presentation, I'll share some historical and current photos of the spaces Arsiak once lived in as a means of trying to recapture the physical surroundings and landscapes that once contributed to her social experiences as a tool in mining the agency of, of space. Landscapes and environments can be read as texts with an eye to locations of constructed agency, which are focal points of collision of physical and mental relations. As de Certeau points out, quote, space is a practiced place, end quote. The ambiguity and permeability of boundaries as liminal spaces offers insights which are useful in understanding the, com the complexity of gendered space. There are many historical actors like Arusiak whose names and impact have been lost and forgotten, some of whom have actively been written out of history. Studying people like her not only enables us to recover individuals discarded by histori historiographic traditions, but also invites us to closely examine diverse lives and circumstances. In turn, this allows us to encounter many other forms, threads, and versions of existence within the Ottoman context that have contributed to and shaped life in different city, in the different cities and regions of the Ottoman Empire, beyond the imperial center, the elites, and the states, state, which have been elided and utterly glossed over. These different lives, filled with various aspirations, also allows uh, us ways to uncover the cracks and divisions, in what are often inaccurately assumed to be large monolithic blocks, but which are in fact made up of countless different elements and factions. Going beyond facile labeling, one can recover the multivalent character of the Ottoman Armenian community and the cleavages therein. Furthermore, viewing the relationship of subjects with the state under imperial rule in categorical, straightforward, and systematic terms is not conducive to understanding the range of social experiences that emerged from this dynamic, with countervailing modalities of rule playing out concurrently. As Lesser Zone points out, life in the late Ottoman Empire cannot be fathomed as, quote, an either or circumstance. We must exercise the patience to consider more than one lived reality and conceptualize lives lived in more than one register. A late Ottoman Armenian subject could feel both ownership and alienation, brotherhood and fear." End quote. Therefore, imperial rule represented not hypothetical or clear-cut alternatives, but simultaneous messy realities. The disparities in imperial rule, often interpreted as anomalies or discrepancies, should rather be decoded as the adaptable and efficient workings of imperial statecraft for prolonging the life of empire. 
By the same token, treating the state and society as two severed entities, with only the former having an influence on the latter, denies their complex patterns of interactions. interaction. Perhaps, as Philip points out, we may benefit from treating, quote, governance rather than state, sovereignty or government as the operative concept, end quote, and from acknowledging the many networks, formal and informal structures and actors with various agendas and aspirations that made up what we simply refer to as the state. With this extensive spatial scope, this paper ventures beyond the narrow confines of area studies and then explores the dense entanglements in translocal, transregional, transnational connectivities in the spaces traversed by Ursiak. In this research, Marsovan emerges as one of the main sites of inquiry, perhaps the most important one considering the narrower scope of this paper compared to the broader project, which brings the periphery to the center of discussion, joining in on the emergent focus on quote, creating new pillars of Ottoman historio historiography, end quote, as Chora, Dardarian, and Sipai put it. While Marsovan as a context was not my initial starting point, instead becoming a site of inquiry for this project due to it being Arustak's place of origin, it has been a valuable site to excavate. Being located in the Sivas Vilayet, the province that accommodated the biggest and most dense Armenian population in all of the Ottoman Empire, the Armenians of Marsavan and their experiences during the genocide are quite revealing. Beyond the works of Kevorkian, Popuchian, and Hovannisian, recent scholarship by Robert, Robert Sukiasian sheds additional light on the conditions and experience of Armenians of Sebastia in the last years leading up to, as well as during, the genocide. The sources that I have relied on for this research include U.S. Uh, census records, naturalization petitions, Ottoman archival documents, various missionary reports, letters, American, Ottoman, Armenian newspapers, uh, French uh, diplomatic uh, correspondence, material objects contained in a wooden chest belonging to Arsiak, filled with what appears to be in part her dowry, addresses, photographs, oral testimonies given by Arsiak and her sister Pailatsu, as well as Pailatsu Torikian Kaptanian's memoir, originally published in 1919, Memoir d'une déportée arménienne, one of the very first Armenian genocide eyewitness accounts to be published. Despite their use to great effect by some scholars, there is still a stigma surrounding survivor accounts that renders them devoid of historical value. Yet survivor sources are just as conducive to historical reconstruction as those of the perpetrator. And the use of uh, Arusiak and her sister Pilatos' testimonies, as well as Pilatos' memoir, pushes back against this parent. The testimony recorded by the British officers, where Arusiak is described as an intelligent woman fluent in English, emerges as a powerful moment of agency in Arusiak's trajectory, where she acts to hold certain individuals accountable. The Kaimakam of Marzifal, Mbaikbe, as well as Governor Ahmed Ma Merbe for their roles in the genocide. The document is not only a form of agency in and of itself, but also recounts an episode of Arusiak's agency in saving her husband and brother from certain death. While there is a body of source material to go off of, one of the major limits posed is the lack of Selbstzeugnis in the case of Arusiak, apart from this testimony. While it reveals some factual information and important insights, it is nonetheless highly formal in style and narrowly targeted in a way that suits the aim of its composition, where we do where, where we don't uh, do not quote, uh, really encounter fully recognizable self. End quote. The lack of Selbstzeugnis prevents us from accessing the mental universe and Weltanschauung of Arusiak with ease. Another problem I, I encountered was a lack of material for Arusiak's young adult life, when she seems to have lived in Ankara with her husband, as well as other missing parts of the puzzle throughout the story. I first encountered Arusiak as an 1894 graduate of the Anatolia Girls' School in the July 8, 1914 issue of The Orient, a missionary publication printed by the American Bible House, headquartered in Istanbul. I was then able to find an image which includes her in the institution's photographic archive, and I was compelled to put a life story behind an image that would otherwise remain concealed and unintelligible by way of adding layers of meaning to it and thereby bringing it to life. The third piece of the puzzle was a naturalization petition signed by Ersek Iskian on December 14th, 1890, 1893, to reunite with her husband who had been naturalized in 1891. Though the passenger list I was able to recover only had the initials of the three Iskians who arrived in New York on April 5th, 1894, the evidence introduced the possibility that Arsiak was traveling with her mother-in-law mother to reunite with her husband. The first piece of the puzzle had already revealed that Arsiak was back in Marcelon for the Jubilee celebrations of the Anatolia Girls' School in 1914. 
which would prove that she went back and forth between the Ottoman Empire and the United States, a life of transnational peregrinations. Given that Arsiak was back in the Ottoman Empire in 1914, the most likely scenario was for her and Yarvand to have given up their American citizenship in the time frame dictated by the state in 1896 and then and had been allowed back into the Ottoman Empire. Arsiak Turki and Skian's story, however, turned out to be quite different than the one I had initially presumed. Upon coming across naturalization petitions of Arusyak and Yarvant Iskian, dating to June 12, 1923, where the couple declared that they hadn't previously sought American citizenship and that this was their first application, I reviewed the earlier naturalization petition once again, and upon further research came to the realization that this Arusyak Iskian was in fact Arusyak Chandigyan Iskian rather than Arusyak Torikyan Iskian, who was born at around the same time as Arusyak Netorikyan and passed seven years after her. And that Arusek and Yarvan didn't leave the Ottoman Empire until departing from Constantinople for New York on November 10, 1922. Despite this major correction to her story, I decided that transnationality was a defining feature in her life, considering how prior to her physical movement between countries in 1922 and her being naturalized as an American citizen in 1930, she had spent her formative years in the Anatolia Girls' School, a transnational site of, quote, relational multilocationality across cultural boundaries, uh, end quote, where a different brand of cultural ideas and values were transported and where Arusyak became grafted onto the network of the Women's Board, Board of mission, Missions, as well as the more general missionary and alumni network stretching back to the United States, end quote, being exposed to, engaged in, and taking part in a transnational experience without having left her hometown, end quote. Therefore, her later physical mobility across state borders was a further step in her transnational journey, rather than being her initial foray. Marzawan, 1878-1897. Let us now proceed to the examination of Arusyak in the space of Marzawan. Arusyak was born on October 10, 1878 in Marzawan to Bogos Torikyan and Akabi Pembean. I have been able to establish that she had at least five siblings, Bogosran, Pailatsu, Marin, Teresa, and Azneve. Given that there isn't much information available on Teresa, who was married to Magurdic Andreanyan, except for a couple mentions in Pilatus's memoir, I haven't been able to establish her birth date. Yet, because she is listed as a sophomore in, a 19, in the 1902 report of the Anatolia Enterprise, she must have been younger than Arusyak, who had completed her degree in 1894. Therefore, Arusyak appears to have been the oldest, and her mother Akabi was 16 years old at the time of her birth. Arusyak spent her formative years in Marsalan, where she attended the Anatolia Girls' School, which she successfully completed in 1894. Her family was one of some means. Her father was a merchant, so they were of middle class, perhaps of upper middle class background. In her memoir, Arusyak's sister Pailatsu talks about her father's initial protest to her marriage to Arakar Kaptanyan, a teacher of humble means, as her father, quote, belonged to a high class of society, end quote. McGrew also talks about how Bogos's niece, Lusa Pertorikyan, hailed from a respected Armenian family. The other source we have that attests to Arusyak relatively, Arusyak's relatively high position in society is a set of material objects in a wooden chest kept at the Armenian Museum of America, which previously belonged to Arusyak. Granted to the museum by Arusyak's granddaughter, Stephanie Tevonian, the wooden chest dated to 1897, the year of Arusyak's marriage to Yarvant Iskian appears to contain, in part, elements from her dowry, also called chase or halal. The chest's luxurious contents of fine silk clothing, needle lace, embroidered towels, clothing with gold brocade, fine bone, uh, fine bone combs, can be associated with affluent mercantile culture and are signs of the fam family's wealth. Some of these objects could have been made by Arsak herself as classes in needlework and dressmaking were part of the Anatolia Girls' School's curriculum. Beyond luxurious clothing, the heirloom collection includes books, but I have not been able to get an inventory from the museum yet. I will not be talking about this chest in depth during today's lecture, as I have so far not been able to examine the elements contained in it. I am looking forward to being able to excavate the materiality and social lives of these objects, whose trajectory mirrored Arusyak's journey as, quote, ob objects are profoundly tied to the human experience. They are enhancers, allowing us to see and, ap and apprehend the world, end quote, in an effort to unpack the complex histories held within objects from creation to consumption. There are mobile objects that have endured displacement and are mementos that house within them complex tem temporalities and legacies that should be reimagined in the domain of the agential. As they moved from place to place, they encountered new sites, acquired new meanings, and have been transformed.
The story and life of these objects is ongoing today in the space of the Armenian Museum of America, where their material history continues to be altered and expanded. After her marriage, Ursa continued to be in a financially secure position, as evidenced by her ability to pull together 500 Turkish pounds to rescue her husband and brother during the genocide, her sending money from Istanbul to her sister pilot Sun Aleppo, despite the exorbitant costs of living in allied-occupied Istanbul, and her ability to make the transoceanic journey to the US with her, with her family, all of which will be discussed in greater detail below. It is unclear whether Arusak had Protestant parents or had converted during her time at the Anatolia Girls' School, or was, was not a Protestant at any point in her life. Her parents could have been Protestant. Her uncle Artin was Protestant, as evidenced by his daughter Armina Torikian's letter to Ottoman authorities dated 1330s. Well, the deceased Friedrich Wilhelm Insurance Company agent, Protestant Torikola Artin, end quote. Though it remains unclear when this conversion took place. Arusa could have been converted during her time at the Anatolia Girls' School, as in each year, there were at least some Armenian girls who did convert. What strengthens the possibility of her having been a Protestant is the fact that two of her daughters, Marie and Anahit, are known to have been part of the Armenian Evangelist Church, the former based on her obituary, the latter based on the luncheon she attended in 2016. Arusak's father, Bogos Torikyan, co-owned a flour mill with his brother, Artin, according to documents I came across in the Ottoman archives, which indicate that the Torikyan brothers were building a flour factory in Chaltek, in the village of Haji Bayram, on the plot of land which they had usufruct uh, rights over, and that they had secured permission to import various machines and tools for their factory from Europe and the US free of customs charges. Artin signed the itemized list of machines that will be brought from abroad as Artin Torikyan residing in the Jami Atik neighborhood of Marsala, but the residence of Bogos isn't disclosed in the documents. The neighborhood of Jami Atik in Marzafon appears to have been in very close proximity to the Anatolia premises. In this slide, you can see a photo of Bogos, which I have found in the memoir of Pilot Torikyan Kaptanian, and she dedicated her work to his memory, as well as some Ottoman archival documents talking about Bogos and Artin's flour mill. In the, first volume, uh, in the first volume of La Turquie d'Asie, published in 1892, French geographer and, and orientalist Cunet, who was the Secretary General of the Ottoman Public Debt Administration for several years, some space to Mills in Amasia, and he concludes, quote, to no Over the past 10 years, thanks to the intelligence and perseverance of Mr. Krupp, the flour mill has made great progress, and today Amasia and its surroundings produce nearly 150,000 bags of flour a year. Most of it is consumed in Samsun, Bafra, Charshamba. 30,000 bags are annually shipped by sea to various parts of the Black Sea, end quote. Mills were used to run the main industries of Amasia under the Ottoman Empire, and Amasia had mills that produced flour, matches, textiles, and tanneries. In the 19th century, the Yeshirmak River saw the utilization of 82 water, wheel, uh, water wheels for milling. The city experienced economic issues in the late Ottoman era, and construction projects were impacted by the state's financial situation. The Ottoman silk industry was also impacted by European silkworm illnesses. After going out of business, the Amasya silk mills reopened as flour mills for many years. There were about 50 mills that were operated by self-taught Ar Armenian individuals in the river valleys in the late 19th century, and these mills were still in operation and producing flour until the middle of the 20th century. Armenian chronicles that I have sifted through do not mention the Torikian brothers in their lists of famous flour millers that include the Nixarlians, Papazians, Yalians, and Honanians, among others. The city's top factories during the early years of the Republic were still its tanneries and flour mills. In the province of Sivas, there were around 205,000 Armenians located in urban centers and 240 villages, 198 Armenian churches, 21 monasteries, 204 schools, and 130 Armenian-owned factories. Urban nodes, which are created by public structures and areas, as well as urban routes, are what give cities their urban layers. As a result of the political or economic demands of new context, many of the historical layers get overlooked, disregarded, or removed. Achikabe examines the continuities and ruptures in the built environment of Amasya in an effort to shed light on Amasya's urban and architectural history, which, like most other peripheral cities of the Ottoman period, hasn't received enough scholarly attention compared to the meticulous attention that Istanbul has received. 
While by virtue of being a port city and the capital, Istanbul saw rapid economic growth uh, and the completion of various investment projects in the late Ottoman period, Amasya's economy was unable to grow to the same extent due to the city's geographical limitations and the absence of important transit channels like the railroad for the, the transfer of raw materials. Therefore, compared to the Ottoman metropol metropolis of Istanbul, Amasi experienced fewer interventions in the built environment, despite the Ottoman state's efforts to bring about change throughout its wider territory. In Hushamatian Bondagan Amasya, memory book of Ponte Amasya, Simonian, a native of, of Amasya who was in his youth uh, during the genocide, talks about how the Armenians of Amasya led prosperous lives and how each household in the city owned a home as well as an orchard. He estimates that a household's wealth was typically between 200 and 1,000 Ottoman pounds, which was a sizable sum. About 40, uh, about 40 households in Amasya were also considered to have assets, including estates and finances, that varied between 1,000 and 7,000 uh, Ottoman pounds. Few Armenian households in Amasya were poor or in need, and there were plenty of job options available, so that unemployment doesn't seem to have been an issue. From the area of Sebastia, several Armenian peasants migrated to Amasya to work as, porter, as porters. Many Armenians who had migrated from Gurun, Arapir, Ang, and Kaiser in search of greater economic prospects had made the city their permanent home and had grown to become residents. In his article on the uh, economic policy of the state towards Sebastia's Armenians from 1913 up through 1915, Sukiasian talks about the anti-Armenian propaganda and, econo and economic boycott that was uh, carried out by the state in the person of Governor Muammar, with the complicity of other state actors to inflict direct and deliberate damage on Armenian enterprises, sometimes in the form of burning mar of markets and flour mills. The Torikian family's from a mill could have been among those destroyed in this environment. Ahmed Muammer, who was appointed in 1913 as the governor of Sebastia, pursued the goal of ending Armenian prosperity and to this end formed different propagandist groups and sent them to different parts of the province. This uh, put significant pressure on Armenian enterprises and in some cases resulted in confiscations, direct attacks, and extreme violence. Ahmed Muammer was a, awarded a first rank Medjidiya medal for his services to the Ottoman government following the genocide, but then was found guilty and deposed. Both Ahmed Muammer, Dan Kardesh, and Faigos, whom Arusyak accused for their part in the genocide, were taken into custody on June 2nd, 1919, and were exiled directly to Malta as part of the second group following the first group of 12 that had been sent to Limnos. Ahmed Muammar, Malta case number 2719 and Faik 2737 were put were both put in group A, which was made up of those uh, accused of persecution and deemed most guilty by the Allied Commission. Even when the Allies began to make concessions to the Kemalist government by releasing certain prisoners, they refused to let Muammar Bey go free, and he eventually fled Malta. So Kiasian lays out the three uh, phases of the genocide as the announcement of the commission's functions, extraction of valuables, and elimination of targets and looting. When the first stations, people of important social standing, the elites, were eliminated, and in the second stations, the men. After the genocide, 11,500 of the estimated 13,000 armies in Marsavan had either been slaughtered or deported. The remaining had primarily converted to Islam. The 950 person uh, Protestant settlement had dwindled down to only 50. The entirety of the Armenian student body of, at the Anatolia uh, institutions, as well as the Ar uh, as well as the eleven Armenian teachers, had left. When the Anatolia premises were targeted by the gendarmes on August 10, 1915, the Ottoman authorities overlooked the students at the girls' school. However, they returned two days later, and 62 young Armenian women were taken away. Against all odds, missionaries Willard and Gage managed to save 48 of these girls after a 25-day ordeal. However, the remaining group consisting of older women, including Lusafar Torikyan, could not be rescued. The Anatolia premises. Quote, in the Marsavan plain, 60 miles inland from the port of Samsun, on the northern edge of the town and scarcely a quarter hour's walk from the foot of the mountains, the site of the clustered Anatolian institutions is about 2,500 feet above sea level, in a magnificent situation among the mountains. Another favorable element is the central position of these institutions. The Black Sea gives quick and easy access to neighboring countries, east, west, and north. The salubrity of the climate is manifest in the robust health of some foreigners who have labored near 50 years at this center. The moral atmosphere is still more important, and it is the fixed purpose of the administration that all students shall find here moral sentiments as pure as the air." End quote. 
The Anatolia Girls' School opened its doors in 1865 and shared its grounds with the Marsvan Theological Seminary, the Anatolia College founded in 1886, as well as the King's School for the Deaf and the Anatolia Hospital. The Marsvan Station was part of the Western Turkey mission field, one of the five missions in Turkey, along with European Turkey, Central Turkey, Eastern Turkey, and the Syria missions. The institution flourished under the auspices of the uh, Women's Board of Missions and became, in the words of the board, quote, the mother of girls boarding, uh, boarding schools in Western Turkey should very suitably carry the banner for the mission, end quote. It was further remarked that, quote, among all the instrumentalities for good in this land, the girls boarding school stands in the first rank. More than any other, it combines the best influences of our religion and brings them to bear on the most plastic material, end quote. Courses of study included the Bible, Armenian, Greek, Turkish, English, math, geography, sewing, drawing, singing, domestic science, physiology, astronomy, and psychology. In 1889, missionaries pointed out that the girls enrolled in the school studied uh, what one would study in high school in America, except that English took place of Latin. In addition to cooking, baking, washing, and cleaning, the girls also prepared food for the winter. And while part of the labor was delegated to hired women, there was still much more work that fell to the girls than would be expected of American schoolgirls. Missionary enterprises raised the bar for the quality of education so that the state, as well as Armenian locals, began opening new institutions with more rigorous teaching standards. In the article published in The Sun on February 12, uh, 1893, the Anatolia Girls School is deemed well, the most important in Western Turkey. In Marsalan, which has long been like a watered garden, the school has enjoyed a good degree of spiritual interest. The age limit of scholars is constantly increasing since it has found that education helps matrimonial interests by giving an added charm and educated wives are in great demand." End quote. There was a fire in 1893, the year before Aristotle graduated from the Anatolia Girls School that burned down one of the school buildings. According to George White's memoir, the fire started around midnight on February 1st, 1893, and the arsonist poured cans of kerosene on the building, dropped a lighted match, and ran. Though no one got hurt, this violent incident found extensive coverage in the American press, being reported by newspapers ranging from the Wichita Daily Eagle to the Sun and the New York Tribune. The Ottoman government agreed to pay full indemnity, and a new school building called Fitcher Hall was erected the following year. Arusyak was one of the six Armenian girls who graduated in 1894. In her letter published in Life and Light for Woman, Miss Jane Smith of Marsalan said, quote, on July 2nd, 1894, the first public exercises were held in the assembly room, the rest of the building being still largely in skeleton. An audience of about 500 filled the room to witness the graduation of a class of six bright Armenian girls. It was a glad day, end quote, end quote. A large percentage of until Totally of students left before earning a degree. Typically, their goal was to learn languages and other skills in preparation for work or emigration. Sometimes their families were unable to cover the costs of their ongoing education. Angara, 1897 uh, to 1912. As I have touched upon in the introduction, Arusyak's life in Ankara is mostly a dark page in her story. And aside from sparse threads of information, including the fact that Ankara was the birthplace of Arusyak's husband and four out of her five children, named Novart, Hovannes, Hovannes Yarbant, Marie and Albert, as can be verified by the US state census of 1925, as well as US naturalization documents. And the fact that her husband was an antique dealer from Ankara based on files pertaining to Arusyak's cooperation with the British High Commission. After her marriage to Yarvant in 1897, that took place in Marsavan, Arusyak settled in Ankara and seems to have lived there from at least uh, 1897, uh, the birth of her, uh, 1898, sorry, the birth of her eldest child, Mark Martha. According to US state documents, the highest grade Yarvan completed was eighth grade, whereas Arusyak had attended freshman grade in college, though is not listed as having graduated college. Arusyak was back in Marsavan in 1912 and continued to live there while her children were enrolled in Anatolia institutions, which is why she was there at the onset of the genocide, as recalled and narrated by Bertha Morley, one of the American missionaries at Marsalan, who was teaching music, geometry, and history at the establishment. Morley also spoke of how Mr. Iskian was taken on June 28th and had been allowed to go back to Ankara on June 29th, 1915. Back to Marsalan, 1912-1915. 
Arusiak relocated to Marsalan in 1912, according to her oral testimony given to the British High Commission, and enrolled her children in the Anatolia institutions. What this train exactly meant to Arusiak will remain unclear, as will what precisely she took away from her time, education, and experiences there. She seems to have continued to be active in the alumni society, so much so that she was a spokesperson for the alumni, making gifts to the faculty on their behalf during the 50th anniversary celebrations of the Anatolia Girls' School. Her sending her children to be educated there is also indicative of her interest in maintaining ties and relations with this establishment and its network. It seems that the Anatolia institutions were regularly attended by families in a multi-generational fashion. The Anatolia Girls' School's Jubilee celebrations took place on June 17th and 18th, 1914. A great tent was erected for the occasion in Fritter Hall, which accommodated about a thousand people with a gratifying number of the alumni, under the direction of Miss Willard, the principal of the school. The events of the day began at 10 a.m. with a semi-chorus, followed by a piano solo and an anniversary address delivered by Reverend Krikorian, a, form, a former, sorry, formerly professor in Central Turkey College, Antep and the editor of the Armeno Turkish, Rahnuma. During the celebration, Arusak read a message from the alumni in which she thanked the school and the staff and stated that the alumni raised $50 as a Jubilee present for the institution. On behalf of the alumni, she then gave the school a sizable painting of Miss Anna Felician, two rugs to Miss Prapion, and a cup to Miss Willard, all of which was received well by the assembly. Her choice of rugs for Miss Parapion could have been motivated by the fact that her husband, Yarvant, was an antique dealer from Ankara, who, according to later US documents, specialized in oriental rugs. The next day, on June 18th, two seminars on the, most, on the two most critical issues for women in Turkey were uh, conducted, with roughly 45 alumni in, in attendance. The school acted as a bridge between the Ottoman Empire and the US, and many alumni used its advantage. In the nine, uh, in the uh, nineteen, uh, sorry, um, in the nineteen o nine issue of Life and Light for Women, Ethel James says the following: "Quote, but I begin to see a new phase of our missionary work: the preparation of these people for United States citizen, cit citizens. If it be that many of them are going to America, what a blessing it will be to our overburdened country to have them come in as educated, Christianized men and women, instead of an unenlightened crowd." End quote. A third of the alumni uh, of the Anatolia institutions had already left Turkey by 1910, predominantly to go to the United States. The majority of those who remained were uh, located in significant Black, sea, uh, black sea port cities or in, uh, or in regional hubs like Ordo, Amasya, Sivas, and Talas. Many alumni were also accepted for advanced study at prestigious Western universities, and their accomplishments can be used as a gauge for Anatolia's educational standards. Over the years, a number of Iskians and Turkians, as well as Telfian and Tohumanians, the latter two families of uh, Arusiak's future-in-laws, seem to have attended both the Anatolia College and the Anatolia Girls' School. While some after graduation made donations and others became teachers, so the lives of Arusiak's extended family were interwoven into the, fam into the life of this missionary enterprise, and attendance there was likely perceived as a marker of elitism and respectability in this circle. Beyond her own children and brother Bogosuran, her sister Pilat, who appears in the 1902 report as the assistant instructor, her other sister Teresa, who was a sophomore in 1902, her cousin Lucepar Torigyan, who had completed a, a course of practical instruction at the hospital and who was nurse and instructor in hygiene, according to the 1911-12 report, and her cousin Benjamin, whose letter to the Bible House mentions that he had graduated from Anatolia College, her extended family, including her future in-laws, were tightly connected to the Anatolia enterprise. This was uh, the case, especially for the Tohumayans, the mother's side of Arusak's cousins from her uncle Artin. Benjamin Torikian's mother was Hripsi Mehirine Tohumayan, and he ended up marrying the Mart Martha Iskian after divorcing from his first wife, Arminyet. But also for the Talfayans, Arusak's sister Az Aznive married Garabat Talfayan. According to the 1902 report, there were five Tohumayans enrolled at the Anatolia Girls' School. There's also mention of an alumnus, Hagop Tohumayan, who, was established, who had established himself in the US as a physician. According to the 1910 11 report, there was another Tohumayan enrolled in Anatolia College, and an HK Tohumayan, class of 1903, is listed as an alumnus. Also, there are two donations made by Mrs. Lucy Tohumayan in the years 1909 and 1910. 
In the same issue, in the section on the Anatolia College commencement, there is mention of Arsiak's son, Hovannes Iskian, whom we know to have attended Anatolia College and who was chosen from the student body because he was related on both sides to members of the Talfeyan family to unveil the large photograph of Ms. Mr. Sarkis Talfeyan, who made the latest large gift to the institution in the amount of $10,000. When Arsiak's husband was taken, uh, Bertha Morley, one of the Armenian missionaries at Marsovan, uh, recorded this in her diary. Two weeks after the murder of her father, uh, Arsiak's husband had been taken. It is likely that the family was staying at the school compound for protection when things began to unravel. Her husband was taken on June 28th, as mentioned before, but the very next day he was released and allowed to return to Ankara. Before leaving, however, he seems to have had an operation on July. Uh, he seems to have had an operation. Arusak lost her father during the genocide, in her and in her testimony, she recounts that he was dragged from his house in his nightgown on Friday, June 12th, tied up with 200 others and taken to a valley to be killed by gendarmes and guerrilla forces two days later. Despite losing her father to the genocide, she was able to rescue her husband and brother from a similar fate by bribing Mahir Bey, who was in command of the troops, with 500 Turkish pounds in gold and jewels to be shared among himself and the Kaimakam of Marisifon Faik Bey and Major Emin Bey. She was able to secure permission for Yarvant and her brother Suran to go to Ankara and a signed permit for herself to remain in Marisifon. Morley also recorded the, the deteriorating state of mind of uh, Mrs. Gulbenkian, who had re recently come to the American Girls School and asked to stay there with her daughters, and who was entertaining the idea of taking poison and drowning her children in a bucket of water. Perhaps when she left Marsalam, her birthplace, it had already become a trauma scape, where, uh, where as Bertram suggests, quote, every image awakened vignettes of danger and distrust, leading to a strange combination of rage, grief, and sensory overload, end quote. This institution was on the surface an educational space where students got acquainted with an extensive area of subjects, joined various clubs and associations, and developed admirable skills, cultural background, and wherewithal that made them stand out in their societies. As Maxudian asserts, students in these institutions were, quote, frequently used as examples of best practices and therefore transmitters of this knowledge and pioneers and models for their communities. The campus complex as an operational missionary field was not only a transnational arena on both so social and ideational levels, but also a highly cosmopolitan space that in the 1912-13 academic year housed students from a vast geography comprising Greece, Russia, Poland, Persia, and all corners of the Ottoman Empire. Sometimes it turned into a politically charged site of confrontation as a result of fraught relationships that resulted in violent episodes. A space of refuge where on the eve of the genocide, many Armenian women sought safety behind the walls of, to no avail. It morphed into a site of grief, trauma, and mental ruptures in the face of atrocities. The meaning of the space, quote, was not fixed, but was challenged and reformulated, end quote, as B.B. Davis and Glido observed about the concept. Approaching the site in substantialist terms as a bounded entity and trying to decipher the complex dynamics in categorical or static terms is not conducive to understanding the range of social experience that emerged from the renegotiations taking place. It was a mutually constitutive space for the parties involved. Just as the local students were changed by shared life with missionary teachers, so were they. Therefore, the complex patterns of interaction that emerge from these relations can only be explored by setting aside dichotomizing binaries of coloniality and resistance, and by considering the social agency of these multiple protag pro protagonists through their actions, reactions, inactions, and strategies. It is equally problematic to approach missionaries or locals as monolithic groups and, quote, homogenize and essentialize the diverse experiences, memories, and representations within the group itself, end quote without any regard for differences in interaction resulting from the gender, class, ethnicity, and, and background, and the like. In the case of the missionaries, female missionaries were fighting for their own voice and agency in their male-controlled denominations that sought to restrict their roles and to whom these missionary fields sometimes offered freedom from the gender limitations of their own societies. Similarly, the experiences of evangelized locals who are now serving as part of the missionary corps were shaped by their unique set of aspirations and complications. After the school had moved to Greece and the campus had been abandoned, the Anatolia premises were repurposed and converted into military structures to be used by the Ministry of Defense and were later converted into school buildings. Today, it stands as the Marathon School of Science. Istanbul, 1915, 17 to 1922. 
There's a lot of ground that needs to be covered in the space of allied occupied Istanbul, but unfortunately we don't have much time, so I'll be focusing on particular moments of RCF's agency and will not be able to provide an extensive overview of the context itself. According to information included in RCF's testimony to the British High Commission, the family moved to Constantinople following the genocide and lived on 8 Rue Anderlich, Pangalta Pera, today Hidayat Sokak where Orisiak's youngest daughter, Anahid, was born in Constantinople on March 26th. It is unclear exactly how Orisiak and her family avoided the deportation process when all of Orisiak's sisters seem to have been deported, lost their husbands, with one Teresa, herself perishing during the genocide. In her memoir, Pilots concludes that her mother, sister, meaning Orisiak, brother and cousin who welcomed her on her arrival from Aleppo, had been miraculously freed from deportation. The sisters were spread out in the Pontic when the genocide began. Teresa was in Ordu, Marina and Pailatsu were in Samsun, and Arusiak was in Marisafon Amasya. Arusiak's location could have given her an initial layer of protection, but we know that missionaries were mostly unable to protect Armenians indefinitely within the Anatolia complex, despite their great efforts. Arusiak did pay a large bribe to rescue her husband and brother, but that again didn't guarantee continued safety. The fact that a large wooden chest with many valuable items belonging to Arusiak could be safely brought to Istanbul is indicative of the fact that the family was not set out on deportation routes at any point and that they made a safe journey directly to Istanbul. While Arusak and her immediate family survived the genocide, that doesn't mean that she hadn't been severely traumatized by the unraveling of the genocide and the loss of her father and one of her sisters. Therefore, when engaging with Arusak in post-genocide allied occupied Istanbul, it is important to pay heed to trauma and memory literature, as well as to make sense of her journey in the context of resilience and survival. Allied occupied Istanbul had become a stage. It was, quote, the, co the cosmopolitan capital of the Ottoman Empire, a center of a kaleidoscope of people and a hub of international political economic rivalry, end quote, transforming its urban cultural landscape. Armenian refugees were arriving in occupied Istanbul as it was facing social and political upheaval. During this period, Armenians initiated what Ekmek Çoğlu calls a pro-natalist campaign for national re revival that was also circulated uh, through women's journals like Haikin. The aim was to boost numbers for a right to self-determination, and this campaign, as would be expected, put women at the center of the initiative to build the Armenian state, both as active participants and as objects of discourse. It was in this climate that Arusiak's youngest daughter, Anahiti, was born. The finances of the city were suffering. The cost of living increased 1800% from 1917 to 1919, resulting in severe coal and wheat shortages and exacerbating the palpable anxiety of the city, filled with foreign troops and refugees. The acute shortages were finally alleviated by relief agencies' imports from Britain and the US. The prices went down by roughly 35% before stabilizing. Armenians in Istanbul organized internally to provide shelter, food, clothing, healthcare, and other necessities, while Western aid organizations such as the American Committee for Relief in the Near East also provided aid and relief. Those who had relatives already in the city often stayed with them, while others became self-sufficient after a short time, with many continuing to be housed in former barracks, shelters, and refugee camps. Meanwhile, Armenians living in different parts of the empire outside Istanbul were, were facing insecurity in terms of uh, their own welfare, as well as, as well as with respect to their property, and were growing wary of a Yarkrotara Krutyun, a second deportation, resulting in remarks like, quote, it is better for us to wander with empty bellies and to porter on the sidewalks of Istanbul than to be killed here, end quote. While many Armenian survivors were making their way to either Smyrna or Constantinople, the testimonies given at the, the military tribunals began to appear in the press, rendering the persecution of war crimes a topic of public commentary. In her memoir, Pailatsu mentions moments of Arusak's agency beginning with how Arusak's financial help enabled her to sustain herself while in Aleppo. The fact that Arusiak referred to as my sister, Mrs. Iskian, in the memoir, was able to send money to Pilots in 1917 and 1918 also proves the former's financial stability, despite the whims of the market in Allied-occupied Istanbul. The French version of the memoir doesn't provide her name. We only come across it in the Armenian version. Quote, can I forget the money sent to me from, uh, from New York by my sister and brother-in-law, Mr. and Mrs. Rantalfean, when the one sent to me by my older sister and brother-in-law, Mr. and Mrs. Iskian, was about to expire. They sent a lot of money from America and Istanbul to my uncle's house, when we hardly had any money. But things often appeared that a person with a pocket full of money could not find a safe place to live peacefully." End quote. 
She also explained how most of the survivors in Aleppo relied on the money that their relatives sent from America, but that some of the, that, that money uh, would not make it to the intended recipient, but would fill up the coffers of the government instead. Payatu then recounts how one day there was a knock on her door and that an officer handed her a piece of paper that had been certified by Talat Pasha that allowed her to go to Constantinople with her, with her son Savak and her aunt-in-law, Hribsme. Quote, our relatives in Constantinople were successful in getting the permission for us to relocate to Istanbul with the help of an Armenian deputy when it was almost impossible for any Armenian to travel from Aleppo to Bolis, end quote. She arrived in Constantinople on June 17th 1918, and was welcomed by her mother, sister, brother, and cousin, and Arusyak, quote, made every effort to soothe and comfort me with her tender cares, end quote. Arusyak was also by her side at the port when she was waiting for her son, Khurant, whom she had left in the care of the Balakchan brothers in the initial phase of the genocide, and it was her sister, Arusyak, who sent her the message regarding her other son, Aram's arrival. In this slide, I'm sharing some documents from the Ottoman archives where Pailatsu appears as a daughter of Artin instead of his niece. There's a whole story behind these simple short documents that reveal a falsehood fabricated for the purpose of survival, creating a disjointed lineage, which became part of the permanent archival landscape of the Ottoman Imperial archives. Pailatsu was Bogos Torikyan's daughter, as is cl clearly indicated in her memoir. Yet given that these are the only documents available on Pailatsu in this archive, this intervention or intentional deviation from the truth would have been impossible to uncover on the basis of Ottoman archival material alone, which serves to perpetuate the created narrative without the aid of Pailatsu's memoir. As she recounts in her memoir, Pailatsu pretended to be Artin's daughter to be able to save him from further deportation. Quote, on a notice which was given to us, it was stated that the government was prepared to exempt from this measure any head of family where there was a pregnant woman. So I presented to the Vali a request in which I passed him, my uncle, off as my father, end quote. Pailatsu must have made this fabrication known to her immediate family in Constantinople, so that in the petition that Armina, Artin's daughter and Pailatsu's cousin, composed to the Ottoman authorities following Artin's death, she made sure to keep up this falsehood and called Pailatsu her sister to protect her. The Ottoman authorities didn't correct this in their internal correspondence, and so this fabrication was re reverberated by a paper trail in the archives. This highlights the importance of, quote, destabilizing the primacy of the Ottoman Imperial Archive, end quote, and problematizing the notion of these archives as the most authoritative and exhaustive for the study of the Ottoman Empire, as Ferguson and Philo argue respectively. Therefore, we are reminded of the need to read against the grain and look beyond the Imperial Archive in search of information by engaging with different sources and different archival landscapes for a more accurate reconstruction of historical lives. The fear of a reprisal from Kemalist group among the Armenian residents of Istanbul as the Allies evacuated the city. MacArthur Seal highlights how the British feared that the number of people who would choose to flee Constantinople in case of a Kemalist victory over the Allied forces could reach 500,000. Though the handing over of the city to the Kemalists didn't turn out to be violent, approximately 2,000 Greeks and Armenians and their dependents were expelled from the city for collaborating with the British. Those who were expelled were never able to return home and their property was confiscated. In November 2022, the former delegate of the uh, First Army Republic, Ferdinand Tahtajian, was, quote, alone in Constantinople to represent the interests of the very many Armenians, end quote. And he's said to have been issuing more than a thousand passports a day. The telegram from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Poincaré, to the manager of the French High Commissariat, Curelli, dating to October 29th, 1923, states, Quote, I pointed out to you the serious difficulties resulting from the unmanned arrival of Armenians who refuse the work offered to them. The Italian steamer Brenta has just arrived in Marseille with 895 Armenians on board coming from Constantinople, whose passports were stamped from October 1st to October 12th by our consulate. End quote. From the obituary of Aristarch's daughter, Marie Tavonia, we learn definitively that the reason the family left for America prior to the end of the occupation was that they had been expelled from the city. New York. Arusek and Yarvant arrived in New York on board Braga in 1922 with four of their children, while their eldest Mart Martha had left for the US a year early in 1921. They applied for naturalization on June 12th in 1923 and became American citizens in 1930. Arusek is listed as a housewife in all uh, of the US state documents, whereas Yarvant sometimes appears as merchant, salesman, or importer of oriental rugs, depending on the document. 
Anahit is the only one of the seven who still appears to be alive. The most re recent mention I was able to find of her dates back to a luncheon of the American Evangelical Church of New York that took place on November, uh, November uh, 13th, uh, 2016, where Anahit reunited with her distant relation, Jennifer Tafel. Novart, the eldest of the five children, graduated from the Constantinople Women's College, among whose graduates are momentous figures like Haide Edip and Pareskevi Krias. She then went on to study at Columbia University in New York, where she's recorded as being a student in the 1929-1930 catalog. Albert is also listed in the registry in the same year as Novart. In fact, four of Arusiak's children appear to have attended Columbia University. According to the 1924-25 catalog, Hovan Nessi Arvant completed a degree in business, whereas Marie Skian got a Bachelor of Arts from Barnard College. The two are also listed in the Columbia University alumni registers, uh, where Hovan Nessi Arvant is identified as working with Sanger Bros, dealers in oriental rugs. Arusak passed away on July 8, 1945, in Wadsworth Hospital and is buried in the Kensico Cemetery. Marie Skian Tevonian is the only one of Arusak's five children to be buried in the same cemetery as her. Given time restrictions, I have not been able to provide, I have only been able to provide a superficial and factual overview of Arusiak's life in the context of New York. Though in the larger project, I'm trying to recreate create her life in the Salzburg context by paying attention to, quote, how tentative, shifting, indeterminate, and elusive. In other words, how queer diasporic belonging itself can be beyond a single heteronormative white narrative of diasporic Armenianness, as Sargassian points out. So this exercise has been a foray into Arusiak Torikyan Iskian's life and agency that employed the lens of global microhistory. Microhistory as a matter of process is defined by its transparency with regard to what we can know, how we can know what we do, and identifying what remains unknown. Therefore, the idea is to showcase the narrative bridges used to formulate a legible storyline and to read the individual's motivations instead of hiding the ambiguities for the historical, of the historical record for the ease of the reader. This is what I have endeavored to do. Pushing back against homogenizing modes of thinking by emphasizing the individual dimension through the nexus of Arusiak and focusing on her situatedness rather than her representativeness in the social matrix, I strove to recapture human agency, subjectivity, heterogeneity, and complexity in juxtaposition to, quote, often, the often flattened accounts of macro history, as Aslan, as Aslan Yan remarks. By analyzing the understudied peripheral landscapes and context of Martovan and Ankara, and by trying to imagine and recreate Armenian life and anxieties in allied occupied Istanbul, I aim to build a thicker context for reading our sex experiences, given the prevalent lacunae in her story. As I have previously mentioned, this is an ongoing project and there remain other sources that I would like to consult or engage with at a deeper level. And I'm hoping to be able to find family archives which would greatly contribute to the study. Arusiak was a historical actor. She was a transnational before she made the transoceanic journey to the US, owing to her virtual mobility, cosmopolitan consumption, and competencies. She was a survivor of the genocide, but was also very active and resourceful in rescuing members of her family in different ways. Despite her impact, she remained a mutant actor. So I set out to excavate her agency and resuscitate her legacy. Thank you. Okay, so you can, if you want to stay up there, we can take questions from okay. the room. Just or, like drink some wine. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We can yeah. take questions from the room, and I think we should like us a slight overview of any questions that will come up online. Um, so yeah, I should just address the Zoom audience too. Yeah, sure. Uh, just to say briefly that you can send any questions that you have through the Q and A button on Zoom, and uh, someone in the room will read those out uh, to Gizem. Okay. Thanks. I'm not sure questions right now, so okay. we have questions from the room. I have a very factual question. The, the, the school, mm -hmm. does it still exist? Well, yeah, it, they actually moved it to Greece. So the, and the, so the, yeah, they moved it to Greece in like, um, the, like late 1920s. And uh, then, you know, it, ha it was abandoned, but then they repurposed the structures. Uh, yeah, the, it was uh, first used for like ministry purposes, and then it was um, used as a school building, and now it is uh, the School of Science, you know, Marisol School of Science. Okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, you said that um, actors like her were largely forgotten. Yeah. Uh, and the female part of that is in yeah. English, I suppose. Uh, or actually written out of history. Yeah. What do you mean? I mean, so for instance, there are some figures uh, that you know continue to be kind of pro Ottoman government in the like you know sort of at the end of the empire who fall out of like you know the historiographic traditions of like both like you know they fall out of like turkish historiography because they're not they weren't like loyal enough but then they're like you know fall out of like Armenian historiography because like uh you know they just like i don't know they don't want to talk about like the people that they call loyalists so there is that kind of like active like sort of um I don't know, writing out of history aspect for some people. But I think in the case of Arusyak, she's just a, simply a forgotten actor. Mm -hmm. I mean, owing to her intersectionality, because, you know, she's a female, she's Armenian, uh, you know, she isn't, um, I mean, she's an elite in some ways, obviously. You know, she's like very well educated. You know, her family is like, you know, you know, of, you know good financial standing. And, uh, you know, yet she's not like, you know, the, the daughter of an Amira from, you know, Istanbul. So, um, yeah. I have one question oh, yeah, sure. from the audience in yeah. the Zoom uh, from uh, London, uh, from Vaskan Davidian. Oh, cool. Uh, he says, Thank <laughs> Hi, <you> Vaskan. <laughs> uh, fantastic presentation. How mm -hmm. did you stumble upon Is uh, Iskian in the first place? How yeah. did you decide to embark on this incredible journey? So, uh, Vaskan, um, I, you know, I was actually doing research on a different topic. And then I found this like, you know, copy of the Orient online and the like the missionary publication. And um, I, you know, started like sort of reading it. And, um, you know, it was like there that I actually first came across Arusyak. And she was, you know, uh, a graduate and she was like a, a graduate um, of, you know, the Anatolia Girls School. But then she was also the person who was like um, basically representing the alumni and um, at the Jubilee celebrations in 1914. And, you know, I thought it was, you know, I, I you know, I wasn't sure that I would be like able to find, uh, you know, much about her, but I decided to look into it and I was pleasantly surprised actually, you know, like how much I've been able to actually uncover so far. There was, yeah. Oh, that was actually the same question. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> okay. I could ask. Yeah. Um, just, I know you didn't you know, go into the American life so much mm -hmm. of this figure, but I was wondering what if, if what she does in America in relation mm -hmm. to her perpetuating her memory, her memory of the Ottoman, of her life in the Ottoman Empire, or whether she, is it, is she you know, looks to put this behind her? Do you have a sense of that? Well, actually, I haven't been able to find um, much, you know, in order to, like, you know, be able to answer questions like that. And, you know, as I had, you know, previously mentioned, one of the biggest limitations, uh, you know, posed, you know, this research is the fact that, like, we don't really have, like, much that I mean, we only have like you know her testimony given to the British High Commission, but aside from that, we don't really have anything written by her, which is why I you know pied up so like her sister's memoir has been like very helpful in trying to understand or uncover her agency. But in the like the uh, you know context of uh, the U.S., I'm obviously like still like working on that, and that's like a site that I haven't like really excavated as much. So, yeah. <laughs> I'll let you know though. <laughs> we work together. So. <laughs> First of all, wonderful thank you for your very impressive talk, oh. uh, excellent talk. At the end of your uh, presentation, you, you, you kind of talked about um, situatedness of your mm -hmm. case versus mm -hmm. uh, representationless, yeah. uh, if I could understand yeah. uh, correctly. I mean, I understand microhistory is about situatedness. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I mean, well, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to ask, but I would like you to talk about this, you know, yeah, situatedness sure. versus yeah. representation. Sure. And also perhaps 
a little bit about the benefits of micro history. Is, yes. it, is it like, you know, all about this unique situated case? Uh -huh. Or, I mean, I was thinking how, for instance, how um, exceptional or how ordinary your uh -huh. case is. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Talk about these yeah. issues of exception and ordinary yeah, and perhaps course. other cases. Yeah. So, uh, situatedness. yeah, thank you so much uh, for your question. So, like, what I mean by situatedness as the post representativeness is that, like, she doesn't have to be representative of any, like, specific group in order for her to be worthwhile to, like, you know, study because, like, everybody obviously has their subjective experiences. So, I focus on her experiences and her agency and her unique situation. Obviously, everyone's situation is unique, but from, like, a larger sort of perspective, I think she is somebody who has certain like sort of, I mean, she has financial abilities, so she's not very ordinary in that sense. Yet, you know, as I have mentioned, she's Armenian and she's a woman and, uh, you know, she, she's just like not somebody that, you know, is usually engaged with. So I think that that's what makes her a subaltern. That's why I decided to sort of, you know, study her because you know, she, you know, she obviously has a story she and she has had sort of, I mean, she made certain sort of, I don't know, like important sort of changes in like, you know, in, in people's lives. And so, I mean, I wanted to excavate that agency. But as I said, she is like a figure who do like own to her financial standing is not like a very kind of, I mean, um, that's like a positive thing, obviously, for, you know, for her, but like, as I said, there are other like sort of things that I think make her like a very disadvantaged figure. So I think, you know, it doesn't really balance, you know, it out to probably ends up being kind of like on the disadvantaged sort of thing you know, as far as like, you know, being studied goes. So I don't know. Do you think that there are any other examples like her? I was just thinking about perhaps. Negro, you know, or other cases. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. I mean, honestly, I was like really intrigued by the case of Pilot, so especially given that she has like this, she has this memoir written, and um, you know, people have like mentioned her, and like they have, you know, but I, I'm not sure that they like, you know, her source has been, uh, you know, engaged with on like a very like you know deep level. So that is something that like you know I might actually end up doing is like to actually work more on like Pilot so or like. You know, in the future, something that I might do. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you come across anything related to the occupation years, whether she went back to Merzifon or re-engaged with the college? Because it was re-established briefly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At that time. So yes, it, you're right. It was. Um, you know, as far as like you know, what I've been able to sort of find doesn't indicate whether she made a journey back, but I highly doubt it. Um, because I mean, it was reestablished. On the other hand, the people that went back were American missionaries who were expelled at first, and then who were allowed back into the empire for a, like, you know, yes, a short period of time before the institution was closed for good. Um, but the people um, sort of the genocide survivors who hadn't made it to Istanbul or Smyrna, who were kind of like, um, in the sort of they found themselves in like sort of Marzifon and they kind of like, you know, flocked there for to safety in, you know, in the college. So there were a lot of people that were kind of, uh, you know, uh, at the Anatoly hospital and that were like, you know, who were being taken care of. And so there was that crowd, but I don't think, you know, Arusyak would have, you know, I, I don't, I just don't see it, but I don't really know it, like, you know, definitively, I guess. Brian Ward, thank you, and oh. Heather, both are thanking you, as they say, as a fascinating Thank so, you so much. No, uh, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> thank you, Brian. Okay. Uh, any other questions in the room? And we might have the room for a glass of wine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just outside and continue chat. Okay. Okay. Sure. I'll stay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, thanks so much, Gizem. Um, it's time to say goodbye to the online audience now. Um, but we hope to see you at the next uh, BIA lecture, uh, information about which you can find on our website or by signing up to our mailing list or on our social media. Um, yeah, for those of you in the room, uh, we have some drinks next door and uh, we can continue the discussion there. And thanks again to, to Gizan for this really rich um, lecture. <laughs>